there we go, apologies for that. Yeah, no problem. So I'll read the uh, purpose and dignity agreement after I do the uh, opening address because the opening is intended to bring all of our minds together. Uh, we give thanks to all the creator and creation and everything that's here among us today. We give thanks to all the people. We give thanks to our mother, the earth. We give thanks to the waters and the roots. We give thanks to all the grass and all the greens. We give thanks to all the bugs and all the fruits and all the berries. We give thanks to all the birds and the four winds. We give thanks to the thunders. We give thanks to the sun, our elder brother. We give thanks to our grandmother, the moon. We give thanks to all the stars and the skies. We give thanks to all the four sacred beings. We give thanks to the Creator, the one who created our bodies. So if there's anything that I've missed, make sure that you put it together in your minds and give thanks to that thing of that uh, entity, that element that is part of our creation. Um, <clears throat> so we do this to bring everybody's mind together and um, make sure that uh, we acknowledge everything in creation because these are the basic things of life that we can all agree on. Um, so that's why we use them to bring any kind of meeting together. So the uh, purpose and dignity agreement. We're fixing the breakdown of our planet's natural life support systems and runaway climate change. We choose to respond with the best of our abilities in alignment with the XR principles and values. We choose this world and its beings in it and resolve to work together to save our families, our communities, our nations, all people, all animals in the world from much suffering, destruction as possible. We welcome everyone, our governments and other powers to try to act by joining us in the streets and in supporting mass nonviolent disobedience. We work to change the harmful aspects of the things we do and oh, and we, oh sorry, we work to change harmful aspects of the things we do and the way, ways we do them towards taking better care of ourselves, those around us and the world. Dignity. We commit to cultures of respect and sharing dignity as we work together in person, groups off, groups off or online. We communicate with mutual, mutual appreciation, kindness and care. We will speak from our own experience without making assumptions about what is in the minds and hearts of others. When we disagree, we will assume goodwill on the part of others, even though we all sometimes lack skillful, skillful, skillfulness or understanding. When we point out harmful behaviors, we'll be, we will refrain from canceling people by shaming, attacking, gossiping, or dismissing them with negative labels. We will only commit to, to tasks we can do and will return those we have not been able to do. We are a community united in our work, and everyone is valued. Uh, we are what we are. We are what we have to work with. We are family, um, <clears throat> and that's a very important thing. Relationships, and that's uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this um, that I'm doing the opening from the traditional hunting grounds of the uh, Mohawks um, in Gantege, um, also known as Tindanega Mohawk Territory. And um, I think now that we have you all here, um, it's very important that you know and you listen very carefully because it's time to act. It's time to do something. There's people here with messages today um, of complete genocide, how the government is not going to work for you, how you're not going to be able to talk to your politicians, talk to your anybody like that. What you're going to need to do is actually take physical action. 
um, doing something. And now it's time to hear the truth of what we've been, we've been talking about as Indigenous peoples since the time of contact, since the time of invasions. It's time to do something. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Mishati uh, Gayamton, Andrew. We are honored and we are grateful. Can I just see a thumbs up? Can you guys hear me all right? Thank you. Um, guys, please also consider checking out Andrew's professional work, especially his brilliant post, the brilliant podcasts that he does through Credible Mohawk Entertainment. We do have a absolutely packed event, so I'm going to be very quick. Um, please give me about two minutes to quickly speak about um, this event. Um, and also to the speakers, apologies if we keep your introductions quite minimal. Hopefully that also means that we make optimal space for what you've come to say to us. Um, quickly about this event. It is part of a series of events organized by the Let's Get On With It team. The main purpose is a networking opportunity. Get a taste of different approaches to mobilization and then do follow up with people. We have received some critique of the name about using the word world that it might be too grandiose. Thank you, critique is welcome. And the thing that can be named is not the thing, etc., etc., etc. So to cut a long story even shorter, conversion facilitation suggests finding some common non-controversial shared essence to converge through. Please hold that thought some non-controversial shared essence. And if we can all still remember what we signed up for when we joined XR, the principles and values, our aims, what is it that we all share? Maybe we are all here because we care about the world. Anyway, we are as a team completely open to suggestions for better names. If you can, please get involved. We've been approached by other groups to support them in events, and one such event that might be on the cards for the 24th of April is coming up, so please keep an eye out for that. And the background plan is to work our way through the key elements of XR's principles and values, values. so keep a lookout for upcoming uh, meetings around, for example, regenerative cultures. Please stay in touch, and we thank you deeply for being here, for being part of change for the better. We are going to mute the chat while our speakers have stage, and we'll re-enable it before the workshops in hopefully around 45 minutes from now. We're running right on schedule. Um, and with that done, I would uh, again thank you all and like to hand over to James Green from upstate New York, who has a moment of beautiful poetry to help us shift gears after my rambling. And he'll then um, introduce the first plenary speaker. Thank you so much. And forgive us if we... Um, are a little bit awkward in switching people and so on. We're running on a very thin uh, team tonight. James, over to you. Thank you. I'm reading Everything Changes by Bertolt Brecht. Everything changes. You can make a fresh start with your final breath. But what has happened has happened and the water you once poured into the wine cannot be drained off again. What has happened has happened. The water you once poured into the wine cannot be drained off again, but everything changes. You can make a fresh start with your final breath. And with that, I'll pass to you, Tatiana. Hello, everyone. My name is Tatiana. I'm uh, so excited to see you all here tonight. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, of course, to all our speakers and workshop um, leaders. So I would like to introduce three um, inspiring speakers about uh, inspiring speeches about mass mobilization and the need for civil disobedience in 2021 from well-known XR people and radical speakers from all across the movements. So our first speaker tonight is Ina from, she's a frontline defender and artist from Fridays for Future Vindhook. Ina. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. 
my name is Ina Maria Shikongo, and uh, I am a Namibian born in Angola, uh, born in a refugee camp at the time when Namibia was fighting for its liberation struggle for independence against the South African apartheid regime. And today I find myself uh, confronting Recon Africa, this little, uh, sorry, uh, I will try my best to be politically correct, but right now I don't have the patience. But this little company, junior oil company, who came to Namibia thinking that they can just get away with fracking with the Okavango. And unfortunately, uh, they had to deal with um, activists like myself who actually understand what it means to live in war, to have lost a parent in war who was not just any parent who was like the chief of intelligence of the rebellion that led to the independence of Namibia. And um, for me personally, as someone who believes in the beauty of nature in natural solutions, I find it as an insult to have my government, first of all, pardon the apartheid regime for the crimes that it committed against humanity back in the days. And also right now, supporting a foreign company coming onto my lands where my father used to fall, where my father laid the landmines. I'm sorry for all of that, but it is the land that my father fought for, that he died for, so I can live in peace. And now 30 years later, this company from Canada, they want to put me back into time. And no, I am not going back. So what I have to say to the world is, when we are talking about transiting to renewable energies, for you guys, you are looking at, oh my God, this March has been much hotter than any other month. But for me, it is like, oh my God, okay, um, where am I going to get food from? Because Namibia is a desert. We don't produce food and they're busy fracking up the only region in the country where we can literally produce food. And that is a problem. And also when looking at the past, when my father joined the war and my mother as well, where I was made, where I was born, and I grew up in East Germany, thanks to communism and capitalism and being in the middle of the Cold War and I'm back in my country and I'm thinking, where am I going back, you know? And then I realized that the system has never changed. The system has never changed for the people of color, for the indigenous people. And that is something that is rooted within us. Because when you look at the greatest invasions, hmm, the greatest invasions that Africans and indigenous uh, Asians and Chinese people have overtaken years before the invasions took place. And they've done it in peace. And now all of a sudden, these people, they came to the Africans, the Americas, and the Asians, and they decided that they are going to have it all. Hmm? They imposed their religions on us. They imposed their systems on us. Even in my own language, you can tell when something came before or after Christianity. My people today, they argue that to be gay is not natural, it came with the Christians. And then I asked them, if you have a word in your language that says that you're gay in your language, it means that it was there before the Christians. So who came to impose what is wrong and what is right? Because you have the word for gay in your own language, which is eshenge in my language, but for the word Trousers, for example, it's bruku, ombuluku. Ombuluku comes from the Afrikaans word, which came in with the Dutch settlers from South Africa, bruk, ombuluku. So please leave the gay people alone. But it is much, but it goes much further than just um, when did what language or when did what word or when did what start within my culture. Because me personally right now, as a frontline defender for the Kavango, where I feel that, um, to be honest with you, there's no way that I am literally going to let a 
foreign company come into my country and take my resources. Uh, and then like a month later, I realized that, oh shit, it's like 10,000, it's like more than 10 companies coming to my country. <laughs> and then I realized that, okay, so you, my government, you have been busy against my back because I am an orphan of war and you, and you swore that you would look after the people that died in the war. And right now you are selling off our country. And when you look at onshore production and how much water you need and how much water Namibia has and how much we are already suffering from droughts, including everything else that the West has imposed on us. It doesn't make sense. You are condemning my people to death. You are busy committing a suicide, a genocide. Sorry, not a genocide, but you are busy committing a Holocaust, not recon Africa. So for me personally, right now, where I am, where I am seeing how this perpetual system of exploitation is going on. I'm like, yo, 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 guys, yo, pull the brakes, man. I know that I'm, I am a very short girl. Eh? I am shorter than Madonna. I must just put that out. I'm very short. I'm very skinny. I got three kids and I look like I am a teenager. And, and then I'll be like, yo, black don't crack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just got to rub it in. But I have to say this one thing. Our people, we cannot take this type of injustice anymore. There are so many natural solutions on how we can solve economic crisis. COVID-19 taught us that we need to centralize, that we need to decentralize production. And actually what that, what that means for the people is that me in Namibia, I can continue cultivating my baobab or I can continue doing this and that and that. And I can give you what you don't have. And what you have in Canada that I don't have in Namibia, you give to me, you know, a healthy exchange rate, a healthy exchange rhythm. But the system that has been ruling this planet for more than 800 years, but please correct me, because I don't know when the invasion started. I know that our Bantu people, when they left Central Africa to come and colonize the Sun people, it was a, more than a 600 or 800 years ago, you know? But uh, me, myself, I am a Bantu, but I have um, ancestry of uh, the Demba and the Sun people as well. And that invasion, I know that it happened more than 800 years ago. But should I be held a victim to what my ancestors did, did to the indigenous people here? And then again, when I am talking about neocolonialism, it is wrong for these Canadian companies to come into our... Satya, I am on the phone, go to bed. You see, that is motherhood. We are parents, we are here trying to raise and bring up our children. And at the same time, we have to fight fossil fuel companies. This is nonsense. What is it that you people in the global north, you can go to bed, switch up your light, and you don't even know where the energy comes from. The energy comes from the murder of what my father had to go through, okay? It goes through that sacrifice that we as activists have to put our lives on the front line. Kial Sin. 19 years old, she died how many days ago? Hmm? How many days ago? And she is fighting for the right of her people. And today, don't tell me Ina Maria tomorrow you'll be alive because of Namibia. No, we as environmental defenders, we defend what has to be defended at that time. Whether we lose our lives, whether our parents or our children live or die, who gives a shit? What matters 
is the survival of what we are. What Brick and Africa is doing should be stopped because they are not only condemning the people of the Kavango for now, they are condemning a region, they are condemning a system, they are condemning wildlife. And let me tell you something. I know that we all have our own sacred spaces on the globe, but I will still point you back that if we want to make a difference on this planet, can we please meet in the Kalahari and we ask the ancestors of the Kalahari to protect the rest of the world? No denial, my people, my black people are your people because we are united and we are from the same source, the same, the same source of life. I know I am late, but nobody cuts me. That's why I told you to put me later. Hmm? Now I'm gonna be African. I am so sorry. Everyone just has to listen. What Recon Africa is doing in Namibia, it is repeating the Holocaust of what Hitler did. Hey? Not only that, they are repeating the Holocaust of what the Spaniards did, of what the English did. And right now, as a black short woman, I am telling you right now, you are not touching the Kavango Delta. And we as indigenous people, as indigenous tribes, as people that are connected to the roots, I am not talking about the roots of where you are from, I'm talking about the roots that come from below the ground and go into the heavens. We need to connect on a certain level so we can really bring about this harmony. It is a battle and to fight for love, you know that it's a very difficult job. So we need to do this together as a team. We need to unite, unite from everyone, from everywhere. But I'm telling you right now, guys, you better come to Namibia right now. We gotta go to the Kalahari, meet up with the sun. No, don't cut me off, young dude. Uh-uh, don't cut me off. We gotta unite in the Kalahari. We have to go to the source and we need to heal the source because Africa has been suffering way too much so the West can live the way they are living today. And that is the truth. Long live Thomas Sankara. Long live Ken Sarawiwa. Namaste. Thank you so much, my lovely Ina. Next, we will, um, we're honored to invite Dali Nicole, who's a Wet'suwet'en woman and Gidim Den clan member. Dali. Oh, there we go. Hari Sai Sozi Dali, Wet'suwet'en Gidim Den Cassia Kasli. My name is Dali and I'm Wet'suwet'en. Um, my clan is Gidim Den, and I am currently actually on Haudenosaunee or Ganyaga Hega. No, it wouldn't be Ganyaga Hega, it'd be Haudenosaunee and um, territories in so called Ontario, in so called Canada, um, the stolen land of Canada. And um, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here. Um, as Andrew said, I I do believe that this is a really important um, moment in time that we're at, uh, especially in, or for people in the BIPOC community. We're seeing huge amounts of um, militarized police forces uh, being used to remove our people from our lands, as we saw in, in my home territories. Uh, in the name of resource extraction, and um, it's it's not it's not as I say it's not as bad as some other areas. We didn't have anybody that was killed, um, but it's Canada has a great way of enacting polite genocide. They under the guise of um, you know this, we're, we're such a friendly country and we're able to export all of these resources to other countries, but it comes at the cost of my people. 
It comes at the cost of indigenous lives and it comes at the cost of people's basic freedoms. This isn't, this isn't a situation where it's not affecting everybody. It's affecting everybody in so many ways from infringement rights to um, the climate crisis that we're currently in, this climate emergency. And I think it's really frustrating for me. I have the, um, I have the Instagram page with Soton Checkpoint and I try to show how these struggles, how our struggles are, are intertwined and the importance of us acting as a collective. Um, but it's hard, it's hard because there's so much going on and it, it's like this, uh, it's like this great umbrella attack by the colonial capitalist system. And we're, I guess, um, we're fortunate that we have technology like this so that we can connect and so that we can inspire each other and we can encourage each other and hear each other's stories, but it becomes overwhelming at the same time. And I think that um, this is where it's incredibly important that we don't only share our, our stories of the collective hurt, but we make sure that we share stories of collective healing as well. And with that being said, I don't, um, I don't believe that it should be passive movements like protests and petitions. And I think that we, we do have to have very real direct actions. Um, the only way that we saw any, any sort of um, removal of police violence or the, the reason that we weren't, we didn't have the snipers on our territories, didn't shoot people was because they knew that people were watching. Um, this isn't the case with everyone. We need to make sure that we amplify each other's voices and that we recognize how we are all connected. We recognize that every single one of us is going to be affected by this colonial capitalist system and these imperial imposed borders. We need to make sure that we're amplifying voices of members of the BIPOC community. And I just, I think that we need to remain hopeful. Obviously everybody on here is, because if you didn't have hope, you would continue down the path of destruction. So we have to remember that. We, we need to think of this not as being, um, you know, angry or, or solely concerned with the fact that, that our world is in this state of crisis. But we need to remember that we are the eternal optimists, that we are the ones that recognize that we have our ancestors behind us, that they have made it through so much. And when we talk about, you know, the, the struggles that we've faced, and Canada and it's, it's, it's gentle and polite genocide, we need to remember that, that all of these struggles have happened over time and we've made it through each one, but we've had to do it collectively. We've had to do it by calling on each other and amplifying each other's voices. I mean, the reserve system was, was the basis for Hitler and his concentration camps. This is something that, you know, History repeats itself until we finally say enough is enough. And while we're in the midst of this global pandemic and we're making sure that we care for each other in other ways where the colonial capitalist system is failing us, we need to remember that it's so incredibly important that we ensure self-care as well. Because if we burn out, we can't help anybody else. So. I really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really incredibly appreciative of everybody that's come here and being able to connect with so many people. And I really, I really hope that this lull in the, um, in the colonial capitalist economy and the recognition that this system is doing exactly what it was meant to do. It's meant to keep all these people, you know, these, this little group of people, these billionaires up here, the people that are profiting off of it, the male pale and stale that are always sitting at the top. And it's meant to keep the rest of us down and fighting amongst each other. So I think that we need to recognize that 
well, you know, many of us have differences. We all have different struggles. We all have different, you know, focal points within our, our territories and our areas. We know that we all have to survive and we all need to rely on each other to do it. So I don't know if that was anywhere near 10 minutes or not. I have no idea, but <laughs> I think maybe I've said all I can say right at the moment. Um, yeah. Delay, that was fantastic. And, you know, I mean, since the pandemic, time has been canceled, right? So it's fine. You know, we all just exist in the bubble. Um, <laughs> next, I have the great honor of presenting um, Awkward with Zoya Patrona and Ann, who are abolitionists, social justice activists, co founders of 10 Demands, and the co creators of the 10 Demands for Justice. Awkward, would you like to take it away? Thank you. Um, and I definitely agree that all of these um, sometimes seemingly um, isolated struggles are absolutely connected. And what we focus on, which is um, what they call criminal justice in the United States, um, is not in any way um, disconnected from the climate crisis, which you know also predominantly impacts and disproportionately impacts the same people. Um, we there are also tie-ins certainly with what was said prior about you know the importance of people watching. Um, a lot of the progress, while limited to date, um, that has been made results from independent journalists and everyday people um, filming the police um, and using social media to spread awareness and galvanize uh, support and, and mobilize around things that we may have been less aware of um, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so having said all that, um, in the United States, uh, we saw the beating of Rodney King by the Los Angeles Police Department about 30 years ago. Um, that was covered um, by mainstream media, believe it or not. Um, it was on TV, and those of us who were alive, we all saw that. Um, over the last three decades, while reformers, um, who essentially are looking for that gentler version of genocide, uh, preached for cops to have control over who sees what with body and dash cams, independent journalists and the average citizen has gained the ability to FTP or film the police. Um, this is how we saw Eric Garner get choked to death in New York City and how we saw Mike Brown lying dead in the streets in Ferguson. Uh, we protested, the Black Lives Matter movement began, we interrupted the Democratic presidential debate on national television, but again, not much changed. And, um, you know, policing and mass incarceration stem directly from slavery with Jim Crow in the middle. And now we have new slaves and not much has changed uh, since the civil rights era. Um, then all of a sudden, the whole world saw Derek Chauvin suffocate George Floyd for nine minutes on the streets of Minneapolis. And like Eric Garner, he said over and over again, I can't breathe. And for some reason, the protests erupted. This was the biggest sustained protest movement in our nation's history. Defenders of lives of color and anti-fascists were on the streets in every state. Um, and we knew it was time. There were a number of activists, myself included, uh, Zoya Petrona on and others who um, knew each other a little, but hadn't worked uh, directly together on any um, specific action or cause. Um, but we came together in um, late April, early May, because we knew this was the time to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, mobilizing was happening. The passion was there. The, you know, the terror of um, the terrorism of the police um, and what it's all for, which is the enslavement of certain criminalized populations was coming to the forefront. What we, what we understood was that we needed demands because um, protest has to be for a purpose. The protests all over the country um, force the power holders to listen and give us a seat. Um, and as Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't bring a folding chair. Um, we knew that if we got a seat at that table, 
or we knocked the table over, or we pushed ourselves into those city council meetings and into the mayor's offices, that we needed to have concrete demands, um, making it clear exactly what needed to end today and what the solutions were for a more humane, just society. So we built the 10 Demands for Justice, the road to abolition. Um, it focused and continues to focus primarily on two areas, education and action. As far as action, um, as soon as we released the demands, we put them in the hands of protesters. We distributed print flyers to activists in cities across the country so that they had them to guide them as they were facing off with police and risking their lives. Um, we've also expanded our efforts to include all people in this country who may not, due to COVID, due to family, um, due to priorities, may not be willing or able to risk their lives on the street and face further police brutality, um, but and, and may also not have enough money to donate to mutual aid groups in their areas, but want to make sure that their votes count. They want to make sure that their elected officials understand that if they do not act on behalf of their constituents, they will not hold office any longer. So we have created through ResistBot letters that you can send to your mayor, your governor, your state Congress, and your national Congress representatives all through your phone by sending a text. This informs them of what we're focused on and what needs to be done. This is their opportunity to either take the lead or to be silent and lose their, their office and their power. Finally, we created a song. Um, I'm a hip hop artist um, and we created a song with all proceeds going to Movement for Black Lives, another opportunity to give what we could back to the people most impacted by um, racism and classism in policing, um, prosecution and, and sentencing. Uh, finally, when it comes to education, our primary goals have been to dispel the myths, the myths about cops in cages and the myths about abolition and what it means. So I'll run through those very quickly for you. And then I'm going to pass you on um, to some of my cohorts who will break down the specific demands uh, pretty quickly. Cops in cages do not deter crime. Cops don't stop crime. They don't solve crime. In fact, they increase the likelihood of future criminality and increase the size of the criminal population. In no other job on earth could you be successful 2% of the time and not only keep your job, but get raise after raise and pension, et cetera, et cetera, make $100,000 a year or more. But that's the, that's the case with the police. They solve 2% of all major crimes. Prisons don't rehabilitate. They dehumanize, they isolate, and they destroy safety nets, which leads to recidivism. We're not making our country safer if we believe that we're putting people in prison to come back out again and be functional members of society. What happens when people are away is they lose their family connections, their community connections. They, don't, they come out and they don't have a job, they don't have a house, they don't have a car, and they're felons. So they can't get a job, a house, or a car. When it comes to abolition, abolition is not anarchy. It's not a lack of accountability. It's not about absence. Like Ruth Wilson Gilmore said, it's about presence. It's about building life affirming institutions or remedies for the underlying causes of crime, like jobs training, education, substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, mutual aid, wellness checks instead of patrols in a different form of justice that truly holds people accountable to the people and the communities they've harmed. It's called transformative reparative justice, where both the perpetrator who has probably been a victim themselves and the victim are repaired and transformed through the process with mediation, rehabilitation, and service. And finally, abolitionists do not believe that tomorrow we should wake up with no prisons, no jails, and no police. At least in the United States, we are not prepared for that. We have not built these life-affirming institutions yet, but that is the reason that we start with defunding. All of the money that goes to the police departments, the billions and trillions of dollars, should be defunded 
and reallocated so that we can build these life affirming institutions. And when we're prepared to do that, we won't need cops in cages at all. I will now pass you on to uh, co-founder Zoya. Hello, pleasure to be here. Uh, before I run through the demands, I just want to say that uh, I absolutely agree with uh, the other speakers here today and that the ruling class has no incentive to listen to us. So we have to become impossible to ignore. And uh, while there are many routes to action um, and for us to obstruct business as usual, that for electoral progress to happen, it must work in tandem with grassroots pressure. So um, our demands, we researched and put together with a large group of people, and there are 10 of them. I'm going to start with number one. Defund the police and reallocate resources to impacted communities. Um, this includes disempowering police unions and other protections that prevent police from being accountable and divesting and re uh, reinvesting into healthcare, education and other social services. Number two, to demilitarize the police. Disarm all law enforcement, including police officers and security guards, starting immediately with all military grade weaponry and equipment. Enforce abuse of force laws, make all body and dash cam footage public, and the federal 1033 program that provides military weaponry to local police departments. Pass HR 1714, the Stop Militarizing Law Enforcement Act. Require all burn grants be used for non -carceral, carceral alternatives to incarceration instead of police department militarization. And all grants from the Department of Homeland Security, Joint Terrorism Task Force, FBI, and Federal Justice Department, and all Pentagon giveaway defense appropriations, and all militarized international police training exchange programs, cancel all police and government contracts with private and public institutions that develop surveillance technologies, establish national, state, and local legal restrictions to prevent police departments from purchasing or using military weaponry. And just to underscore the importance of this, $6 billion is the New York Police Department budget, and it is the same as the entire defense budget of the country of Ukraine. Our uh, police budgets are bloated and stealing resources from social programs that would prevent crime to begin with. Number three, eliminate discriminatory policing, prosecution, and sentencing. Repeal the 1994 Crime Act, abolish Public Law 280, transfer authority directly to First Nations, and mandate that any criminal infraction on indigenous lands be subject to sovereign nation laws, regardless of the individual as a member of the indigenous sovereign nations. And broken windows policing, stop and frisk, racial profiling, repeat offender policing, gang policing, drunk driving checkpoints, neighborhood policing, immigration paperwork requests, and all other racially biased practices. Decriminalize poverty by repealing all laws related to the street economy and the occupation of public space and mandatory arrest and failure to protect laws that lead to the criminalization of survivors of gender violence and all fines and fees associated with the criminal legal process including ticketing, cash bail, court costs and parole and probation fees. Implement stringent limitations on the number of cases managed by public defenders. Limit prosecutorial discretion and, and prosecutor immunity. Immediately remove all law and oath breaking judges. Document and publicly report racial and economic disparities on a court by court and judge by judge basis. Number four, Institute complete law enforcement transparency and accountability. Create an independent national database of police crimes, brutality, and misconduct. Implement independent community-led police department reviews and data audits. Require public reporting of all police records and schedules. Immediately terminate and eliminate pensions of any officer found guilty of manipulating data, covering their badge, turning off their body or dash cam or illegally stopping a citizen from filming. 
And number five, independently investigate all police crime and abuses of power and qualified immunity. And in qualified immunity is extremely important because it shields officers from any civil uh, responsibility towards citizens. Uh, it allows them to escape accountability for indefensible crimes just because they hold a badge. Establish an independent national review board along with community level oversight committees to investigate all police officers or police department employees who have been involved in or witness to any police related crimes. Implement immediate termination of any officer found guilty through independent investigation and required that officers participate in a pre-established program of reparative justice. Mandate that any police related crime against any member of a First Nations be addressed according to the indigenous sovereign nations law require all costs of police related lawsuits to be covered by officer pensions and or personal liability insurance. Create a legal fund for victims of police brutality, immediately dismantle any police department that violates civil rights. Um, I'm going to hand off the mic to Anne to go through demands number six through 10. Is Anne ready to join us? Is that Anne J? She should be. No, Anne. I don't think so. What's Anne's username? It, it was Annie Banani. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Hi. Um, one second. Okay. Yeah, so like demand number six is install community representation, oversight, and safety measures. Elect independent community councils for needs assessment, municipal design decision decision making, I'm sorry, and oversight. Prioritizing representation by marginalized groups. Invest in community-based public safety measures, including peacekeepers and wellness checks, intervention, violence prevention, skills-based education, mental health services, substance abuse treatment, mutual aid, mediation, and reparative justice. Mandate state level monitoring for proper checks and balances. So this is basically just community oversight. Um, we want to create commi uh, committees for the people and by the people. For example, investing in social workers, force responders, and civilian corps. Demand number seven, end strategic counter protest violence. Repeal all anti-protest laws. Terminate all officers guilty of arresting and applying unnecessary and excessive force against all protesters. A violation of their civil rights is guaranteed by the first amendment. Ban the use of tear gas, pepper spray, rubber bullets, and all other crowd dispersal methods. Strip police authority to issue dispersal orders. Expend all protest-related convictions and free all protesters in jail or prison. Um, this is incredibly important because in the U.S., for those who aren't American, the First Amendment guarantees the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Um, uh, there was the largest protest um, lawsuit in the U.S. was in 2014 in New York City at the Republican National Convention under Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Um, the, the payout was over $10 million because several protesters were sent to makeshift, a makeshift prison on the New York docks where they were actually, many of them got bacterial skin infections and some of them were actually hospitalized right after. And um, with the Ferguson Black Lives Matter uh, protest and the Occupy Wall Street protest in, all throughout the US in 2000, um, I believe it was 2010 and 2012, so, uh, tear gas and uh, nightsticks were used on peaceful protesters. And that a lot of governors had called in the National Guard, which is a military branch in the US, to police and to um, intimidate the protesters. That's why we need to end strategic ground to protest violence. Demand number eight, apologize and provide reparations. Publicly apologize and provide indemnification to victims of police violence and racial discrimination in policing, prosecution, and sentencing. Pass the Commission to Study Reparations Act, HR 40 and S 1083. Mandate Congress implement and enact recommended reparation proposals within 120 days of the submission of the commission's report. Immediately begin reparation disbursement to improve the lives of African, African descendants in the United States and to foster economic, social, and political parity. Invest in equitable opportunities for First Nations and provide reparations for all descendants of, indi of indigenous peoples of America. Recognize all First Nations and honor perpetuate, and perpetuate all treaties, including those not ratified as well as obligations to self-determination and returns to land. 
issue and read a formal apology to Black and Indigenous peoples. Implement comprehensive factual and unabridged social studies pertaining to Black Americans and Indigenous peoples as part of the national curriculum to combat their erasure, foster compassion, and shift the paradigm of systemic and um, racism and implicit bias. So um, in the US, uh, Black Americans are more likely to um, to be incarcerated at five times, 5.9 times the rate of whites and indigenous are about like six point times the rate of whites. And in Canada, it's 10 times the rate of whites. So that's why it's important that we actually provide reparations and actually target these communities to help end their, um, help end their targeting by the police. Number nine, end the war on drugs and the criminalization of drug use and addiction, pass the CARES Act of 2019, expend all nonviolent drug-related convictions and lay over risk, and provide mental health, behavioral health, and addiction recovery services nationwide. On indigenous lands, provide resources for those services to be overseen by First Nations and implemented at the discretion of each sovereign indigenous nation. Legalize marijuana at the federal and state level and respect the sovereignty of First Nations that jurisdictionally protect all 573 recognized nations from any federal or state penalty for the cultivation of marijuana. Pass the Marijuana Businesses Access to Banking Act of 2015 and invest in state and federal revenue from legal marijuana into Communities Act most invested, most impacted by the war on drugs. So um, studies have shown that whites and whites use drugs at the same rate as every ethnic group, but black and indigenous are unfairly targeted. We actually have to um, do criminalization and legalization also won't matter if we don't expunge all prior records. After all, we are a movement for racial and class justice. And the, there is that old adage that none of us are free until all of us, are, until everyone is free. Demand number 10 is end carceral punishment. Everyone, free everyone in jails, prisons, youth facilities, detention centers, beginning immediately with the elderly, disabled, and immunocompromised, nonviolent offenders, undocumented Im immigrants, criminalized survivors, and those hailed on bail for parole violations, free all political prisoners, including Leonard Peltier and Numia Abu-Jamal, remove, except as a punishment for crime from the 13th Amendment, ban solitary confinement, decriminalize misdemeanor offenses and probation parole violations, repeal all three strikes and habitual offenders laws, Ban the box. End the school to prison pipeline. Re uh, repealing truancy laws, removing police surveillance technologies and metal detectors from school and eliminating zero school tolerance discriminatory policies, suspensions and expulsions. I believe was awkward going to be finishing up this section for 10 demands. Awkward, did you want to come back on and close this and we can move on to testimonials? Yeah, Making thank you. Um, just so everyone knows, I'm sure it was really hard to, to follow all of those details. Um, so if you're looking for, um, to be able to read it in, in your own time, you can go to 10forjustice.com. It's T-E-N-F-O-R justice.com. And I just wanted to give you guys a sense of, um, you know, positive positivity to close out. Um, since May, 2020, organizers in 20 cities across the US have won 800, more than 840 million in police department divestments and more than 160 million in community investments. So the work that we and others are doing is working and will continue to work um, in cities like Austin, in cities like Seattle, and in other small and large cities and towns nationwide. Lovely, thank you so much, Awkward, and everybody from 10 Demands and 10 Demands, co-creators of 10 Demands for Justice. And Andre, I believe and you- Yes, we are only going to have one testimonial now. Um, and guys, again, I apologize for us trying to squeeze so much into so little time. 
Um, Howie, are you with us? Howie's from China. Over to you. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Owe and I'm an 18 year old vegan and zero waste a climate striker from mainland China. And I have been coordinating Fridays for Future China for the last one and a half years. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm very happy to be here and to share some of my ideas with you. And for my first year as an activist, I'm almost completely alone. I was rejected from attending um, the International Youth Climate Summit um, in China and labeled dangerous by other climate activists. Um, and I was also kicked off from a Harvard summer school uh, just because I'm researching a project called how to develop the climate strike movement in China. And so I, during the, those two months, I drifted about China for two and a half months. I sleeping everywhere I can find, such as 24 hour um, shops and 24 hours um, um, uh, bookstores or benches of the university. Um, yeah, and I would like to share that uh, what is the climate awareness right now in China and what I feel when I come to German, Germany, Berlin, because right now I'm in Berlin, Germany, for we'll study the movement uh, for half a year. Um, so there is, a, you, uh, there is a climate report come out at uh, the end of the 2020 and about the youth climate awareness and behavior report. And the example of this report is over 5,000 undergraduates and graduated students from 18 to 24 in China, which is almost the most climate educated people in China. And there is a very shocking rate, which is over 60% of them think themselves know a lot or relatively know about the climate change. However, 50% of them think the climate change is caused by a hole on, on, on the atmosphere, which is a wrong statement. And recently I'm here in Germany talking about how the climate movement raised people's awareness. And I realized that even in the climate movement, there are so many activists, they give up, they um, just waiting until the election or waiting until the lockdown to be over. Um, so when I do a very simple survey on the streets, I can find over six people among 10 people, they are just don't want to answer our questions about the climate. I know that um, our climate movement has raised up a lot of awareness, but there are still a lot to be done and the privileged people here in Germany or in the UK, there are so much that we can do in, even in this time. And I really want to say one thing is that I know that uh, many people think that the civil disobedience don't work in China, but actually it works because uh, example is that four weeks ago, three Fridays for Future China accounts or all blocks in Chinese social medias and over 300,000 Chinese web users viewed it. And we, we even criticized by the Chinese youth, um, communist youth league. But 10 days later, we still create new accounts and they change their narratives that they are very shocked that we are so resilient. So I think that the civil disobedience works in the countries even like China. So I really believe that in the events like this, the people from all around the world, we connect with each other and we still have the heart that to fight. And this is really, really important. So I think um, that's why um, I'm here. And I, that, that's why we are all here. We have the vision um, for the change and we act on it. Yeah, great. Um, well, it it was a stonker, Peter, and I, I'm sorry, was it Caroline, um, the two scientists that he was presenting with? Um, 
you know, everyone has to get a handle on what the information is and what their feelings are. And clearly, Peter has done that. You know, he's, he's felt this thing. He's got information. And we have to adapt both of those, each one of us, so that we can act. It's beyond words now, but we still, as human beings, have to get our heads around it. So he started off with how he deals with the catastrophe, the stress, the anxiety, which was a really brave thing to start with, to declare how bad things are for him personally at times. Then what I remember from the talk was the coral, the pictures of the coral and the impossibility of tech solutions dealing with a warming ocean, the frankly, the impossibility of that. And then various scenarios, if we do everything possible, these are shared socioeconomic pathways and representative pathways. I mean, these are very difficult jargon things, but what I got out of this was we all have to adapt what the facts are, feel them and get on with it. So my thing in Wales, where we have a lot of bridges, is if we, if we, stick to our total forever and ever and ever carbon carbon budget we've got between six and eight years by the best possible science until we're completely and utterly fucked and if you were crossing a bridge and that gives us two out of three chances of staying reasonably clear to 1.5 degrees if you were crossing a bridge would you have would you cross it if you had a two thirds chance of getting across it? In Wales, we wouldn't, we'd go the long way round. So the thing is for me is to find out what, what the facts mean for you, feel it in your own way and then act. And Peter Kalmus, and I think it was Caroline, I think, sorry, Caroline, I think really gave us, gave us what it felt like for him and what he knew. So that, that was our group, it was a great group. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Tatiana and James, if we got someone else, or shall we move on? Yeah, I'd like to um, go to Rowan Tilly, if you'd like to say a word about your workshop. Oh, um, oh, um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, we looked at a basic of, of nonviolence definition. Um, and then we also talked about how nonviolence can be a dialogue and, and it made up of a kind of a challenge and response that goes on through the action and that everybody's invited to be part of this dialogue in the press and the courts and so on. Um, and how that, that process creates transformation. Um, and then we also, uh, we also talked about how um, there's, some people suggest that nonviolence is divisive um so we looked at how it isn't basically and um, that when you when you name and claim and frame um an action as being non-violent it's like a bit it's as though non-violence becomes like a magic word um and if you don't use that non-violent uh if you don't use that word um in a way you kind of short circuit your power because the power comes from actually using the word and and really framing it as non-violent and making that very public um, and also part of that process, um, we looked at um, how nonviolence in global justice is, is like two halves of a whole. And um, we need to avail ourselves of the richness that can come from um, creating this wider theater of participation with the movement of movements. And the, the way to do that, uh, the way that we can really make sure that nonviolence stays strong um, when we're taking action alongside other movements is by really becoming really strong in our own shoes and really anchoring ourselves in our principles and values. And paradoxically, by making ourselves strong, it enables us to really reach out with a, a genuine hand of friendship to other movements and, and so that they can also be really strong and anchor themselves in their own principles and values 
So it's not like we need them to be like us and we don't need to be like them either. It's about respecting the integrity of each movement and that builds, builds trust and uh, encourages us to, make, to, to find new ways of, of taking action. Um, and in that process, we need lots of humility as well because we don't have the answers. It's an experiment in truth whether we're working with our allies or whether we're working with our opponents. Um, and we had some interesting discussion as well about uh, um, what's going on in Hong Kong and Myanmar and, and the extent to which they use the word nonviolence or not. Um, and we also talked about uh, how non-cooperation in the courts um, could be a solution uh, for people in Norway who are having problems with the fact that the government are very sneakily trying to keep everything as quiet as possible. Um, so, and that was, that, that was about the sum of it. Thank you, Rowan, that's great. Right, <coughs> excuse me. If everybody's ready, we're gonna start the next session. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I have to admit, it took me quite a long time to become active for the issues I cared about. Um, but yeah, my journey with um, activism in exile uh, pretty much started when I uh, went to the Netherlands to uh, get my Masters of Science. Um, while I was there, I came across a little Guardian documentary about uh, Roger in the lead up to the uh, Seven Bridge blockade in London. Um, and I realized that that was pretty much what was missing from other environmental movements that I had been following closely. Uh, you know, the threshold wasn't as high as it was for Greenpeace actions. You don't have to necessarily like, climb an oil rig or be a member. Uh, it's more effective than traditional campaigning, but it still targets the right institutions. Um, but when I started, there wasn't a lot happening around me. So I started my own local group. I became quite heavily involved in setting up XR Netherlands and I began my journey with XR. Um, you see, my time's running out. So maybe I'll just use the one example of an action that I was part of um, which kind of illustrate the, the point that I want to get to is about how to build effective solidarity between global uh, North and South movements. Um, so the one example that I want to use is an action that we did against the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague. Um, there was about a group of 20 of us um, who went into their uh, headquarters under false pretenses of wanting to visit their uh, visitor center. Uh, we then got in, we blocked their bridge, which connects the security to the main entrance, and we held it for a couple of hours. Um, that action essentially got a huge proportion of their police to that point, um, huge disruption for them. ICC had to close their front doors. People couldn't move in and out of the building. Uh, we got retweeted by Naomi Klein, CNN, Independent, Guardian was, um, was, uh, had us published within a couple of hours. Um, and it only took about 20 people and about four hours of uh, dedicated um, work on the day. Um, but being back in South Africa now, I'm kind of reminded of what it takes to do that kind of action and get the response that we did. Uh, police here aren't held to the same standards. Getting arrested here is a lot more dangerous than it is compared uh, to, to Europe and um, yeah, elsewhere, I guess. Um, and if you manage it, you, aren't, you probably aren't gonna get the same kind of exposure you would elsewhere. So there's a lot of different contexts that need to come into play when, when considering how to mobilize in, in the global South and especially in South Africa. Um, and yeah, maybe the one thing I can say from the Global South perspective is that we, we can support the Global North by informing them of the governance and, and financial institutions that they should focus their attention. You know, the massive oil projects, the deforestation projects, uh, the things going on here that have their headquarters overseas. Um, I think these are, these are conversations that really need to be had. Um, and yeah, events like this are crucial in, in giving us that, that platform. Um, so maybe just to close, uh, understanding what we can do on opposite sides of the world uh, to most effectively 
hit the governing and financial institutions with the limited resources we have is a conversation that I would really like to pursue in other conversations. So yeah, thank you very much for the time. And I think I went over, I'm really sorry about that. Thank you so much, Malik. Everything Changes by Cicely Herbert. After Brecht, Alice von Delt Sick. Everything changes. We plant trees for those born later, but what's happened has happened. And poisons poured into the seas cannot be drained out again. What's happened has happened. Poisons poured into the seas cannot be drained out again. But everything changes. We plant trees for those born later, 